morning, everyone, and um, welcome to our Future Leaders Conference. Obviously, our focus today is environmental sustainability, and um, you'll see by my name, it says Sophia Malou. Of course, that's not me, but that is our head girl who has led this conference from as soon as she got nominated and accepted in that position, she has been developing this conference. We're so proud of today and the excitement that the girls have uh, as we move through the day. Um, most importantly for me, this day is about a couple of things. One, it's about learning more about environmental sustainability and what we can do in what is a global crisis, but it's also about leadership. Um, it's about developing those skills and those attitudes and those behaviors in the young people in the world today to make sure that we have a future that can tackle these global crises, political, social, and economical that we're seeing, including obviously the environmental focus of today. Um, I couldn't be more proud of Sophia for her leadership and for her attitude as she's taken on this task. Um, it's difficult leading in times today. It really is, um, particularly with the changes and the flip-flopping, um, with different requirements and restrictions with COVID. But what I see from Sophia is a true, true leader, calm, sophisticated, intelligent, adaptable, and flexible, um, but most of all, willing to learn. And that is what today is about, is a willingness to learn and tackle some really, really challenging topics. And for that, I'm so grateful for Sophia. I want to say a big welcome to everyone joining us. We have um, schools from around Ottawa and further afield. We have parents, we have alum. Um, the community is vast and today is something that is very special for us. Um, with that in mind, I am delighted that we have Mark Carney joining us and Sophia is going to do a full introduction to Mark, um, but um, he is an extraordinary man and I know he won't want me saying that, um, but I truly believe that the work he's doing is going to make a big change in the world. So I'm incredibly grateful for the time that Mark is spending with us today. Uh, I'm not going to talk anymore because we don't hear from me. You want to hear from um, Sophia because she is a person who is responsible for this incredible day. So uh, Sophia is with me. We are socially distanced. I'm going to put my mask on as I move away now. Um, but I wanted to say thank you once more and I hope you enjoy the day. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Whitehouse. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who's joining us today. I am so excited to be able to introduce our amazing keynote speaker for the Future Leaders Conference, Dr. Mark Carney. Dr. Carney is an economist and banker who served as the governor of the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020, and prior to that as governor of the Bank of Canada from 2008 until 2013. He was chair of the Financial Stability Board from 2011 to 2018. Prior to his governorships, Dr. Carney worked at the Canadian Department of Finance and Goldman Sachs. Dr. Carney is a longtime and well-known advocate for sustainability. He is currently the United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance and Vice Chair of Brookfield Asset Management and Head of Transition Investing. He's also an external member of the Board of Stripe, a member of the Global Advisory Board of PIMCO, a trustee of the, Glo of the Group of 30, a member of the Foundation Board of the World Economic Forum, the Harvard Board of Overseers, Oxford Blavatnik School of Government, as well as the boards of Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and the Hoffman Institute for Global Business and Society at INSEAD. Born in the Northwest Territories and raised in Alberta, Dr. Kearney received a bachelor's degree in economics from Harvard University and a master's degree and doctorate in economics from Oxford University. Dr. Kearney, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We will have 10, min 10 minutes for questions at the end. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions. Dr. Kearney, I will now hand things off to you for the keynote. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia, and thank you, Dr. Whitehouse, for having me, everyone, for joining. Um, I am coming to you from New York. Um, maybe you can uh, just rotate my screen. That's, uh, you can see the buildings. I'm coming uh, to you from New York uh, because uh, in one of the things that I do, and Sophia mentioned, is I do work for the UN, so I'm meeting with people uh, at the UN on uh, how to address climate change. And I'm also meeting with um, some financial institutions about what they should be doing and what they are doing uh, to address climate change. And I was thinking about that um, uh, and, and thinking about the times I've been here in preparation for this. And I, I'm gonna start by recalling um, uh, a speech uh, 
that occurred at the General Assembly uh, here in New York a few years ago, and I was in the I was in the audience, and I have to say, of full uh, disclosure, I'd entered uh, the speech, you know, feeling pretty good about myself. I was going to the General Assembly, and I was still the governor of the Bank of England at the time, and working with others to help uh, de develop uh, schemes uh, to uh, to address climate change. Um, uh, and I felt good up until the point that uh, Greta Thunberg um, began speaking, uh, because as, as you may have seen um, her intervention, uh, she basically blasted everyone in the room. Now, there were some people in the room who might have uh, deserved it, um, but the core point she said was, um, right here, right now is where we draw the line. Um, the world is waking up and change is coming, whether you like it or not. Um, and in essence, she was telling uh, the people in the room and the world as, as a whole uh, that they were failing, uh, failing to address climate change. And she was absolutely, absolutely right. And I'm, I, I give you that image um, and that speech to, and I'll, I'm going to come back to it a bit later in my talk uh, to bring across uh, what leadership is, what uh, people like Greta, people like yourselves uh, are doing, can do, uh, and how you can have uh, an impact. But in order to put it in some uh, perspective, and I know you'll know some of this, but at least I'll give you my perspective on, on the overall issue, which is that um, with respect to climate change, first in terms of the scale of the challenge, um, you know, as, as, as a race, the human race has thrived really over a, a, an 11,000 pe year period of extraordinary climate stability. Temperatures have not fluctuated very much. Um, that's uh, for the uh, geologists amongst you would know it is uh, the Holocene. Um, but now that stability is being shattered um, and we've created a new era called the Anthropocenes. In other words, it's being created by humans um, in, which, in which the Earth's climate is driven not by the rhythms of nature, but the activities of humans. Um, when the Industrial Revolution uh, began and began to spread uh, a little over, over 200 years ago, the Earth's climate began to change. Um, and temperature levels, as you probably know, are now on average 1.1 degrees Celsius warmer than they were in the pre-industrial age. Um, and the last six years have been the warmest on record. And as a consequence of that, our ecosystems, the impact on our ecosystems are intensifying. Uh, the oceans are 30% more acidic. Uh, sea levels have risen 20 centimeters over the past century, and the rate with which they're rising is doubling um, in recent decades. Uh, the ice loss in the Arctic and Antarctic has tripled over the last decade, and extreme events, hurricanes, wildfires, flash flooding are multiplying. Um, and uh, now we're seeing the impact, um, not just on our lived environment, but on species and uh, entire habitats. Um, uh, human activity is now driving the sixth uh, mass extinction with extinction rates uh, at over a hundred times the average uh, over the past several million years. And over my lifetime, which is admittedly as much longer than your lifetime, uh, but it's not that long. Um, over my lifetime, the population of mammals, birds, reptiles um, is estimated to have fallen by 70, 70 percent. Um, now, this is starting to affect our environment as well, our, our cities uh, and our coastal regions. Um, the uh, one example, and out in those big buildings around there are a bunch of insurance companies, their losses from climate events have increased five times uh, over the course of the last 25 years. Um, coastal flooding has risen, uh, has risen already and is expected to rise by another 50% by the end of the century threatening assets worth as much as half of global GDP. Um, so, and uh, there's also a view, and I think this is right, that if we don't address climate change, um, we could lose as much, we could have as much as the equivalent of a decade of no economic growth. Um, and of course, um, a lot of, there, there are many other impacts on things that aren't counted in formal uh, measures of GDP, so uh, the value of species, of habitats, of way of life, of natural uh, beauty. So um, that's 
the problem. Uh, there's many other ways to describe the problem, but that's the scale of the problem. And I think really when we look at these issues, it's, it's important to recognize uh, the scale of the problem. And certainly for those out in these buildings and the businesses behind them, it's very important to begin with the problem and very important to then go to uh, what drives it and how we get to a solution. Um, now, part of what's required uh, to get to the solution, what's causing this is, as, as you know, I'm sure, uh, is the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Um, and in effect, um, the pace of global warming is roughly proportionate to the amount of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We have, in effect, a carbon budget, just like um, your household has a household budget. There's only so much money coming in and only so much money that can be spent. Um, and there is a relatively small amount in that carbon budget uh, that's left uh, to avoid the most uh, destructive aspects of climate change. Um, indeed, to stabilize temperature rises at any level, we must reach net zero. So in other words, uh, the point at which the carbon that, and greenhouse gases that are going into the atmosphere uh, are equivalent to those that are being taken out. Um, and in order to get on track for that, to order to achieve the objective of stabilizing the climate at a reasonable level, um, which is defined as one and a half degrees increase uh, since, um, uh, since the pre-industrial age, uh, emissions need to fall by about 7% uh, every year over the course of the next uh, two decades. Um, that means uh, that in effect, um, your personal carbon budget, the average, if I can take the average person uh, alive today at roughly your age, uh, will be equivalent to about one eighth, one eighth of that of your grandparents. So uh, uh, dramatic uh, falls in greenhouse gas, gases. Um, and so there's an urgency, there's a budget. Um, and uh, the next phase, I, I think, in terms of understanding how to solve a problem is understanding the underlying drivers of human activity, what's in our nature that causes us, uh, has been causing us uh, not to address the issue. Um, and the first um, element um, was not recognizing that this was happening. That's now largely been uh, eliminated. Um, the science is unequivocal and the examples of extreme weather uh, are multiplying, as I've said. Um, the second is to recognize the urgency of action. Um, and one of the challenges has been that um, even though politicians and some businesses and, and people have begun to recognize the scale of the issue, uh, they have procrastinated. Uh, it's human nature. Uh, they have put off uh, addressing the issue to another day um, in the hope that someone else uh, would address it. Um, this is, in effect, a tragedy of the horizon, um, and part of what we need to do in order to uh, address climate change is to bring the issue to the present. I'm going to come back to how that's been done, uh, but bring the issue to the present so that uh, we act with urgency that's necessary. Uh, the other major issue, the other element of human nature that's been driving this is something called the tragedy of the commons. Um, and this is what happens when individuals acting in their own personal narrow self-interest um, undermine uh, the common good, in this case, the planet, by depleting a, a shared resource. And so some of you may know from history that this is what happened in um, the 18th and 19th century in England. That's where the phrase tragedy of the commons comes from. Um, where there was overgrazing on common land, ultimately destroying uh, the common land. Um, this is what happened um, when I was roughly your age um, uh, off uh, the, what are called the Grand Banks uh, in, uh, off Newfoundland uh, with overfishing of what was a common area in the ocean for fishing uh, that decimated the stocks of uh, cod. Um, this is what's happening with the ongoing deforestation of the Amazon. Um, and so to address these issues, um, recognizing the problem, uh, uh, bringing the future to the present and internalizing, taking into account 
our individual impacts on uh, the planet as a whole, um, we have to value uh, the planet um, and we have to value the future. And this is, um, and this is where I'm going to get to the point uh, around leadership and, and bring back uh, Greta Thunberg um, and a number of things, uh, I think a number of you have been doing on an individual uh, basis. Um, and it starts with the advocacy. Uh, it starts with uh, protests. It starts with uh, social movements. It starts with making your voice known um, and the importance of addressing this problem today. Um, and I will say from personal experience, not just because I was in the room uh, when she gave that speech, um, but having witnessed uh, the impact of uh, Fridays for Future protests around the world, um, broader um, uh, political movements uh, that supported this, uh, changes in voting patterns, changes in polling, changes in consumption uh, patterns amongst younger people, all of these uh, individual actions collectively have been having an enormous effect to change the attitudes of those who are making decisions. Um, and so this is hugely, uh, has been hugely important. The second thing that's been hugely important, um, I think of, uh, of the contribution of Greta and others has been to make very clear this carbon budget that I mentioned earlier. Um, so to uh, convince those um, who understand how to run a financial budget um, that they are also spending the Earth's carbon budget and they need to stop. Um, and now I'm in the last bit of my remarks, what I'd like to uh, comment on is a bit of, okay, that's the theory, that's a bit of what's happening, at least from my perspective, um, in the uh, uh, in, in the consciousness of business, of finance, uh, of governments, what do we actually do about it? And I'll finish up with what you can continue to do. And what I've been working on with others has been to change the way the financial system thinks about climate. Um, and in essence, what we've been doing is to try to get the financial system in a position so that every decision they take as a bank or as an investor, as an insurance company, every one of those decisions takes into account the impact of that decision on the climate. Um, so when it makes a loan or when it makes an investment, uh, when it builds, um, uh, builds uh, something uh, new. And in order to do that for uh, the big climate conference in Glasgow uh, in November of last year, uh, we totally changed the nature of uh, the financial system. So we changed the information that companies have to compile and report. In effect, what they have to do is they have to report now how much of the carbon budget they are spending today and how they're going to get that down to zero uh, over the course of the coming years. Uh, and Canada was very much at the forefront of uh, leading that. In fact, Canada will co-host the body that will oversee this type of reporting um, and it will be based in Montreal um, starting from next year. Um, the second thing uh, that we did was to take all of the big banks around the world um, and tell them that they need to bring the future to the present. Um, in other words, think about what their loans will look like and their investments will look like in 20 years, in 30 years, if the world doesn't address climate change and how they could look uh, if we do address it and to uh, get across to them uh, the value of acting uh, today. It's something that they hadn't been doing because of this short-termism, this tragedy of the horizon that I mentioned earlier. We did lots of other things that are worthy and arcane and detailed that changed the plumbing of the system. Um, but the other major thing we did um, and now needs to be put in action was to get the world's largest banks, the world's largest investment companies, um, stock exchanges, uh, all the major financial players to commit that their investments, their loans, their, so their balance sheets, all their money uh, would be managed, um, not ignoring climate change, but taking climate change into account. And they would move that money in those investments over time into companies that are addressing uh, climate change so that uh, we can get uh, collectively to net zero. Now, um, that's 
what was committed uh, in Glasgow. And in fact, we had institutions with more money than is required to make all of the enormous investments to get our economies around the world in all parts of the world to net zero. Uh, more than that amount of money is now committed to be managed in that direction. But we can't take it for granted um, that that is what will happen. Um, and this is where all of us uh, come in and you very much uh, come in. Um, and uh, in terms of what you can do um, to help support uh, this essential move. Um, the first is, um, is think about, uh, for the first actually and foremost is use your voice um, to hold people to account, myself, uh, those in elected government, companies, um, and ensure that they are working uh, to be part of the solution um, and that they know how much um, they're not just uh, emitting of carbon, but what they're doing to reduce that. Um, the second is, of course, in your own personal consumption and those of your families uh, to take climate into account um, and to do what you can. And it does matter. Uh, uh, these small decisions do matter in aggregate um, uh, decisions that reduce um, uh, your own, uh, uh, our own contribution. Um, the third thing um, I think you can all do is, I mean, it's, it's, it's clear, I mean, you, you are the future and um, you will be the future, not just in making these decisions. So thinking about who you will work for and what the values of those companies uh, will be or whether you'll work in public service to be part of the solution for this, uh, but also um, how you will innovate and how you will contribute to some of the solutions, some of the technical solutions that will be required uh, for, uh, for climate change. Um, so voice, actions, innovations, investment, um, all of these things um, will, uh, will be decisive uh, in ensuring that we can ultimately solve this problem. Uh, there's been some big steps taken, um, I think, in the last few years. I, would, uh, I started with um, uh, some pessimism and some challenges uh, from, uh, from Greta Thunberg. I tried to scale out uh, the scale or shape out the scale of the problem, uh, but I would, um, I, I would underscore that um, things are changing um, and things are changing because of the voice and actions of youth um, and youth will play the central role in ensuring that this momentum now that it's begun to be established will be seen all the way through um, in order uh, to solve this issue. So, uh, Sophia, with that, I'm, I apologize, I probably went slightly over, but I'm very happy to uh, uh, try to answer questions. Thank you so much, um, Mark Kearney. As we all anticipated, your talk was amazing. It was filled with such interesting insight on what effective leadership pragmatically looks like and how prioritizing climate will have to be the base of this leadership. And I especially enjoyed how you talked about how these solutions, like particularly financial solutions, have to bring the future to the present. And also what we can do as individual actors, um, as youth, using our voice and taking these small steps to reducing our carbon footprint. So this was very inspirational to all of us and has really set the tone nicely for the rest of our conference. So I will now open the floor to questions um, and I'll give that a few minutes to happen. But first I have a question. So um, the recent IPCC report has yep. once again highlighted this disproportionate impact that climate change has had on low economically developed countries. And I'm wondering um, what responsibility you think high economically developed countries like Canada have um, and how this responsibility maybe translates for current students like us at Elmwood who would like to contribute to helping this cause. Yes, um, well, in, it's an incredibly important point. And the, um, again, I'll, I'll start with the, uh, I'll start with a quote um, of, a, uh, of a leader. Um, and it was in Glasgow at the opening um, ceremony of, uh, of this COP26 conference. And Mia Motley, who is uh, the prime minister of Barbados, uh, she gave her speech and she made the point about the objective and the objective has to be one and a half degrees. Uh, because for her, for Barbados, two degrees is a death sentence, was her phrase. So for many of these small island states, and for many parts of the world, 
um, a climate where uh, temperatures rise to two degrees or more, um, the scale of um, uh, either uh, coastal flooding or extreme temperatures is literally a death sentence for hundreds of millions of, of, of people. So we have an immense responsibility uh, as, uh, as Canadians, um, other uh, so-called advanced economies to help solve this issue. It starts at home, but your question rightly is what can we do for these uh, countries? Um, and sticking with my world of finance, uh, there is a lot we can do. Um, uh, and the first is to um, live up to our responsibilities for immediate uh, support for their um, climate uh, transitions and to improve, if I can put it this way, their defenses against climate change. Um, so it's seawalls, it's stronger buildings, it's, uh, uh, it's better, uh, 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 it's just a host of things that needs to be done for the uh, infrastructure in these countries. Um, the second big thing is using and transferring technologies that we have that are particularly effective in these countries, think renewable technology and helping to build them out. And then the third big thing we need to do um, is to bring um, uh, money at scale uh, into these economies above and beyond money from the public sector. So we need money from the private sector. And part of what I work on is ways in order to channel that. Um, and then in terms of students um, from Elmwood, uh, and beyond, uh, what, what can youth do? I think one is, um, uh, is, you know, there is an element of this which is, uh, which is charitable, which is helping to address the immediate, uh, so uh, classic uh, elements of that. Secondly, uh, helping to bring expertise and working in these economies uh, to help them uh, respond to it is critical as well. And then I think uh, 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 the final thing I would say is, again, and it goes to, uh, a point of leadership uh, more broadly is um, connections with these economies and, and people in these countries. Um, and the reason I say that is one of the important things for leadership is to understand uh, um, how things are seen uh, by the most disadvantaged people. And I'll, I'll put it this way, which people from the periphery, you see most clearly a situation when you, when you see it from the periphery uh, I, I always felt that when I was uh, governor of the Bank of uh, England, Canada, that it was from the perspective of somebody who's unemployed. That was the best way to look at what the economy was like um, or those who were more disadvantaged. You had a better sense of how well the economy was doing um, when you had uh, more contact with those uh, people across Canada in that case. Thank you so much for your response. I especially like the last part that you mentioned about how you have to really be able to understand the perspective of that country and not just come in with like this Western point of view, because like understanding that whole like cultural, social, political context is probably really important when you're implementing these kinds of solutions. Um, it kind of goes back to the whole idea that you were bringing about like psychology and like working with psychology um, when we're implementing these solutions. So I'm wondering if we have time for one more question. Sure. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. So this comes from um, I think a grade eight homeroom. So are you worried about wealthy companies simply escaping regulations by buying offsets rather than actually making meaningful yeah. changes that's that will right. impact the future? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so uh, I think the, the first thing to say, and, and so everyone uh, just we're on the same page, uh, there's something called an offset, which is a way of reducing carbon, but it's done by somebody else. I mean, I'm simplifying. It could be somebody else planting a tree or, or a mangrove swamp is two examples. And the action of doing that reduces carbon. But the wealthy company over here just goes along its way and continues to uh, pollute uh, the atmosphere. And um, what, we're, what we've done is the commitments of the companies. Um, this has been a risk, so it's a right question, but the commitments of the companies is to reduce their absolute level of emissions. So they're not allowed to count for the offsets in their emissions. They have to reduce their absolute emissions. And that was that information I talked about earlier. And when you look at the financial institutions, and this is the critical thing, uh, at least from my perspective, is that the bank that lends to that company that's polluting um, or the investor in the company that's polluting now we'll have to report and take responsibility for the emissions of the company as well. 
Um, so you get three groups of people who all have the incentive to reduce their absolute emissions. Last point though, if I may, is that what we want, and it's not settled yet, is that as the company reduces its absolute emissions, that it should be required to compensate the world for the emissions it still has by buying offsets. Um, and what does that do? It, it, it means that we stop uh, burning the Amazon rainforest and in fact, start reforesting that rainforest um, and the benefits go um, to directly to the people who live there, uh, the indigenous peoples who live there and also uh, to the planet. Awesome, thank you so much. So I think that's all the time that we have left for questions. Um, so um, I, may I, Sophia, can I just say one yeah. thing? Cause I see a question in the, in the chat from oh, yeah. uh, my old colleague, I shouldn't say old, sorry, I take this back. My uh, longtime colleague at the Department of Finance and, and beyond Louise Livonian, um, who also served um, at uh, the International Monetary Fund. Um, and she just asked uh, for, she knows the answer to this question, but she's just asking this about externalities and how do we get people to price the externalities to bring those external costs like carbon into the company uh, themselves, which is a critical question. And I think there are two ways to do that. Um, the first is you put a price on carbon. Um, and so in Canada, we have a price on carbon and it's uh, in fact, the design of the system, which I suspect Louise was involved in uh, creating is probably the most sophisticated and world leading approach to this. Um, so it's a very good design. But then the last thing uh, or a way we reinforce that is we make the companies report how much carbon they're emitting we have uh, students such as at Elmwood and, and, and other schools and youth around holding those companies to account. Uh, we have the leadership of individuals as well as the price mechanisms in the market. And that's really what drives uh, the activity um, that we need at the, you know, at the, at the scale. So again, it, there, there are technical answers and they're important, but in my view, it also comes back ultimately to uh, leadership uh, and the power of the individual. Thank you so much. That's actually so interesting because we've been learning about externalities in economics class. Um, so it's really cool that you can actually quantify these externalities and that now companies will be held accountable for those. Yep. So thank you so much, Mark Kearney, for that incredible keynote and for all those amazing responses to the questions. I learned so much. And again, I'm sure that everyone found your talk very inspiring. As a token of our appreciation, we had chatted to Cleo actually, and based off of her recommendation, have made a donation to Eco Justice, and we'll also be sending a gift home with Cleo. Um, so thank you so much, and thank you to all the schools, Elmwood parents, and alum that joined us today. The session is now over, so you are free to leave. Wishing you a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Sophia. Thanks, everyone.